Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lena Bader, and I'm the former president of the George Mason Students for Justice in Palestine chapter, and presently a proud George Mason University alumni. As I speak to you guys this evening, please do me a favor. Please place your hands out in front of you. Clench them and unclench them. Clench them and unclench them. Tonight, it is an absolute reward for me to stand here before you and present a new cabinet of the Students for Justice in Palestine. The sheer joy and pride that I felt when I knew that this organization would continue after my graduation has yet to have the ability to be expressed in words. This evening, we present to you a couple of extraordinary human rights pioneers who bring to your attention the topic of Zionism. Clench your hands and unclench them. Zionism has no one uniform definition or ideology, but instead has evolved from a dialogue of several concepts. However, the common denominator among all Zionists is the claim that present-day Israel is the national homeland of the Jewish people. Clench your hands and unclench them. Zionists also place a particular focus on the Jewish self-determinations while it supports itself on historical claims and religious traditions which link the Jewish people to the land of present-day Israel. Clench them and unclench them. After almost two millennia of the existence of the Jewish diaspora without a national state, largely in Germany, Poland, Russia, and the rest of Central and Eastern Europe, a group of secular Jews decided to respond to the growing anti-Semitic views in Europe, and alas, this political movement was established by Austro-Hungarian journal, journalist Theodor Herzl in 1897, following the publication of his book. And it was at that time that the movement sought to encourage the migration of those of the Jewish faith to the Ottoman nation of Palestine. Clench them, unclench them. Zionism grew rapidly and became the center focus and the most dominant force in Jewish politics, especially throughout the unfortunate destruction of Jewish life in Central and Eastern Europe, where the Zionist movements were rooted. The movement was successful in establishing a country of Israel on May 14, 1948, as the Jewish people's homeland. Clench them, unclench them. Zionism, at its very beginnings, contemplated a homeland in either Africa, South America, or in Palestine. But they began with a goal of colonialism, which translates today into the word settlements. The notion of expelling the indigenous Palestinian population was an early component of Zionism. And I make this claim by citing Herzl's diary from 1895, which states, we shall endeavor to expel the poor population across the border unnoticed. The process of expropriation and the removal of the poor must be carried out discreetly and circumspectly. Clench your hands and unclench them. See, the claim of being the chosen people, which has been echoed by Zionists, Jewish leaders, and others throughout history, is essentially promoting the unfair confiscation of land, expulsion of people, and the main cause of violence in the Middle East. The UN General Assembly, since, 19, since 1975, has claimed in resolutions, quote, Zionism is a form of racism and racial discrimination. Clench them and unclench them. It was repealed only in 1991 per the United States request to invite Israel to the Madrid conference. Clench them and unclench them. You see, claiming the right to Zionism is essentially parallel to the right to affirmative action. It's punishing the current future of the Palestinian children and people because some other nation decided long ago that they wanted to create genocide and wipe out the Jewish people throughout the years of World War II in Central Europe. Zionism is South Africa. Zionism is apartheid. Zionism is to be equated with racism and ethnic cleansing, and it's a shame. But Zionism is the Holocaust repeated. It's a shame that the suffering of the Jewish people in the Second World War in Europe created extraordinary sympathy among the peoples of the earth. And this sincere and commendable sympathy has been incessantly exploited by the Zionist propaganda machine since the year 1945. There's nothing anti-Semitic about this because Palestinians are Semitic people too, and they always have been. Clench your hands and unclench them. We've always wondered why the United States and others have long supported and protected and armed and befriended and allied and jeopardized 
our own economy, and our self-determination for the existence of this state and this ideology. But the truth is, Zionism can best be defined as bullying, especially because as far as this generation is concerned, think please, in regard to Foreman Congressman Findlay's book, he wrote a book called They Dare to Speak Out. And that's to discover the sorry record of the immense resources that the Zionist lobby invested in destroying the careers of all politicians across the United States who had voiced some qualms about this nation's subservience to Israel. Think of the Norman Finkelsteins. Think of Rabbi Yosef Chaim Salmonfield. Think of Helen Thomas. Think of Miko Paled, who spoke out and paid the price for doing so. Clench and unclench. However, this historical blackout is coming to an end. More and more people are questioning the Zionist version of history. At the United Nations and more throughout Europe, the questions have been raised and largely answered. The answers are a variety of criticisms of the Israeli state, and some of these criticisms center on Israel's practices. Others point to its underlying philosophy. Relax your hands. It is my honor to prepare you for a night of intellectual exchange as two of my very own role models take the stage. Relax your hands. Open your eyes, your ears, and your mind to hear an explanation of an alternate reality where nations are not rewarded due to faith, but due to the coexistence of peoples of a multitude of religions for centuries. Relax your hands. My aunt told me once, you know that you're dead. You know that you're no longer effective you, when you can no longer clench your fists at the things that you know are unjust. We are a human race, and injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. In fact, it can't be awarded to one side alone. It must always be given to both. I thank my father, my mom, and my incredible brother for teaching and instilling in me these values. And I thank your parents and your families for instilling the same in you and for being a large part of the reason that you guys are here tonight. Please join me in giving me a warm welcome to our current SJP Vice President, Rania Kabani, as she welcomes our first speaker. Hello, thank you all for coming. Miko Palette is a peace activist who dares to say in public what others still choose to deny. He has credibility, so when he debunks myths that Jews around the world still hold with blind loyalty, people listen. Miko was born in Jerusalem in 1961 to a well-known Zionist family. His grandfather, Dr. Abraham Katznelson, was a Zionist leader and signer on the Israeli Declaration of Independence. His father, Mati Paled, was a young officer in the War of 1948 and a general in the War of 1967, when Israel conquered the West Bank, Gaza, Golan Heights, and the Sinai. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Miko Paled. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you all for being here tonight. Okay, a lot of papers here. Um, I want to thank SJP for putting this event together, and um, just let them know how much I appreciate their work and the tremendous, tremendous effort that they put in, not in this campus, but at campuses across the country, uh, to promote um, justice for Palestine. I've, I've been, you know, I've been speaking quite a lot in colleges everywhere, and most of the events are put together by SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine. They go through, first of all, it's a lot of hard work to put an event together or to put an awareness week together, but promoting justice in Palestine is not the most popular cause in America, as I'm sure you know. And for these guys to do it year after year, event after event, um, they get beat up pretty badly by the, usually by the college administ administrators, by the pro-Israel uh, groups, and it's not an easy task. And they do a tremendous, tremendous job, I think. So let's all give them a hand. I think they you know, deserve it. Yeah. Before before I begin my remarks, I always like to make a disclaimer. And. The disclaimer is that if anybody came here expecting to hear a balanced presentation, then they can uh, just go home. Ask for your money back and go home, because this is not what this is. You know, there are certain issues, there are certain issues where you have to take a stand. 
There's certain issues where there can be no balance. You know, I saw a sign on a church here in D.C. that said, uh, torture is wrong. You know, torture is not wrong. Um, crossing the street where you're not supposed to is wrong. You know, stepping on somebody's toe and not saying, excuse me, is wrong. Torture is a brutal crime that deserves to be punished. And so I think it's important on an issue like that to be very clear. Abusing children, killing children is not wrong. Abusing and killing children is a crime that has to be punished. And on this issue, this particular issue of Palestine for me, and I'm sure for many of you, is deeply personal, deeply emotional, and I don't think anybody can deal with this issue in a balanced fashion. People like to believe that we have, you know, two nations who just don't get along. And a lot of times it's compared to kids in the playground. Well, they don't get along and the, the adults should stay out and let, let them work it out. And that's why, for example, American presidents always say, well, you know, we can't, we can't intervene. They have to work it out themselves. I think a better, a better analogy would be a kid in the playground running around with a loaded weapon, shooting in all directions. And then you ask yourself, well, should the adults interfere? Should they intervene and, and put a stop to it? And I think the answer would be yes. And I think this is what the situation is like in Palestine, Israel being, of course, the bully with a loaded weapon. Um, I began tweeting just a few weeks ago. And I just saw a tweet yesterday from the Deputy Foreign Minister of Israel, Daniel Elon. And the tweet said, 74 years ago, 74 years ago, the Palestinians uh, lost an opportunity to have their own state. Some, I'm, not, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. 74 years ago? The Palestinians lost an opportunity, you know, refused, refused uh, an opportunity to have their own state. It's one of those statements where if you started counting the mistakes, the errors, and the, and the misinformation, you, you, could, you couldn't stop. Of course, it wasn't 74 years ago. It was 64 years ago yesterday that the United Nations passed a resolution calling for the creation of two states in Palestine, a Jewish state and an Arab state. And the resolution itself, the way it was, I think had no chance of survival anyway, but that's beyond the scope of tonight's discussion. But I think it's important to go over and see what happened immediately after that resolution was passed. And I talked about this at another lecture, and I mentioned the phrase ethnic cleansing. And somebody called out, what ethnic cleansing? And as I thought about it, I thought, well, you know, this is actually a pretty legitimate question because there's not a lot of information about what actually happened over the last 64 years in Palestine that's out there here in this country. Other countries, in, for the most part, many people do know, but here in this country, people really don't have a clue what happened between that day, 64 years ago, when the United Nations accepted that resolution and all the way to this day. And I think the best way to characterize it is, of course, ethnic cleansing. One of the reasons I think Americans don't really know much about it is because in all the discussion groups, in all the dialogue groups, in all the debates, one of the conditions that the Israeli side always imposes is that certain issues, certain issues that Israel is not comfortable with, won't be discussed. So, for example, the ethnic cleansing is not discussed, and all of the, all of the symptoms that demonstrate that there was an ethnic cleansing are never discussed. So the refugees are not discussed, and um, the forced exile of people is, are not discussed, and the destroyed homes are not discussed, and so on and so on. All the, all the different aspects of the problem that point us to, to the fact that this was an ethnic cleansing. So I think tonight what I'd like to do is to shed some light on this and perhaps dispel a few myths and take a close look at the process that began exactly 64 years ago and is going on in full force today. The ethnic cleansing of Palestine is the issue. The ethnic cleansing of Palestine is what drives the Zionist policies towards Palestinians and towards Palestine. 
Now, as you, as you may have heard in the introduction, I come from a deeply Zionist family. My grandfather signed the Israeli Declaration of Independence, ladies and gentlemen. You can't get much more Zionist than that. My father was a general in the Israeli army. You don't get much more Zionist than that. This was my upbringing. And to hear, first of all, to stand here today and talk about Zionism, having learned from the Palestinian aspect what Zionism means, after having learned from an Israeli perspective what Zionism means, is almost, it's a little bit strange, I have to tell you. It's a little bit strange. But the reality is that when you go through life, you have to make a choice whether you're going to take a look beyond the narrow walls that are built for you or not. And the minute you take a look beyond those walls, you discover a whole reality that you did not know existed. And this is where I stand today. Um, so like I said, on November the 29th, 1947, the United Nations voted to partition Palestine. Within a year, within one year of that resolution, the Israeli forces managed to, to take over 80% of Palestine, to displace 800,000 people from their homes, and to destroy 500 towns and villages, all within a year. This was before there was an Israeli army. These were militias. Israel became a state a little bit later on, within one year. In December of 1948, in other words, just a little over a year after the first resolution, the United Nations passed another resolution calling Israel to allow the refugees to return. What Israel did is it began, began building towns and cities and highways and shopping malls for the Jews that were coming on Palestinian land, excluding, of course, the Palestinians from ever participating in this, in this building and ever returning, and passing a law that forbade the Palestinians from ever returning, and then passing another law that allowed the government, the new state, to take over the lands and the property that was left behind after the Palestinians were expelled. So regardless of the fact that there's a myth out there, there's a story that was created afterwards that Israel was attacked, that the new state was attacked, that the Jewish community was attacked, and the, what had happened after that was a result of that, that there was no ethnic cleansing. We know today for sure that the creation of Israel was made possible through a systematic campaign of ethnic cleansing that was conducted by the Jewish militia and involved massacres, involved terrorism, and involved the wholesale, the wholesale looting of an entire nation. And I'll tell you a, a personal story that relates to this. My mother, both my parents were born in Israel, or Palestine, it was called Palestine. And when my mother was young, she was maybe 20, she was already married, she had a baby. My father was part of those Jewish militias, he was an officer and he was fighting. And she lived in Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem, when, the, when Western Jerusalem was taken by the Jewish forces, by the Israeli forces, of course, the population was expelled. And there are a couple of neighborhoods within Jerusalem, in West Jerusalem, that are distinctively Palestinian. They're, they're still there, the, the, home, the homes are still there, the people are no longer there, but the homes are still there. And when the population was exiled, these beautiful homes were offered to young Jewish families, young Israeli families. And of course, she was the wife of an officer, so she got first dibs, and she was offered one of these beautiful, beautiful homes, and she refused. And she told me this story years and years ago, many, many times, but for the first time many, many years ago, and she told me she remembers <clears throat> as a child walking around those neighborhoods on the weekends, on the Saturday, seeing the family sitting in, out front in the lemon tree, and again, the beautiful homes and how quiet and pretty they were and so on. And she said, how could I take somebody's home knowing that they live in a refugee camp and they can't come back? So can you imagine, imagine how much this mother misses her home? Can you imagine how much this family misses their home? And she said, when the soldiers came in and began looting, the coffee was still warm on the tables. People got up and left minutes before that. And then she described to me the truckloads of loot 
And her comment was, how, how are they not ashamed? How are they not ashamed to go in there, take these homes, take them stuff, knowing that the families are only a few miles away living as refugees? So if anybody wants to deny the fact that there was an ethnic cleansing, that there was looting, you know, a st things like that don't happen as a result of miracles. Things like this happen as a result of violence. And that's exactly what took place there. After the war, a small number of Palestinians still remained within Israel, within the state of Israel. But now, rather than being the owners of their own land, masters of their own land, they were there at the pleasure of the new landlord, which was the state of Israel. And they were designated a very interesting, a very interesting name. They were designated the name of Arabs of Israel, which means they're Arabs, which means they could be from anywhere, and they happen to be in Israel. And Israel may or may not grant them citizenship, may or may not grant them rights, may or may not let them stay on their land. And for the first uh, 20 years, of course, they lived under a, a military governor, uh, governor, and then after that, as third-class citizens all the way to this day. Now, if you move forward some 20 years from there, 1967, there's a there's a myth that says that Israel was, in 1967, Israel was attacked by three massive Arab armies and then courageously fought, defeated them, and conquered lands to the north, the east, and the south. And regardless of how often this myth has been dispelled and how many books and documentaries and so on have been written and filmed about this, it still doesn't stick. People still say, yes, but Israel was attacked. Well, I'm about to publish a book. It's called The General Son. It's about my, the, the path my father took and about my work and my activism and so on, about my family. And one of the things I did was I went to the Israeli army archives to learn about my father's career. And he was a general during that time. He was a general during the early to mid-1960s when th this war was planned, when the Israeli army was being prepared for this war. And one of the interesting things that I saw in the minutes, in the minutes of the meetings of Israel's top generals just before the war, the discussion between the generals was this. The Arab armies are not prepared for war. Therefore, we must strike now and destroy them. Now, specifically, they were talking about the Egyptian army. There was a conflict. There, was an, there were some issues with the Egyptians. And the generals wanted to begin a war immediately. And the Israeli cabinet was hesitant. Was hesitant. And there began this tug of war between these two power, uh, power centers. And the generals, as you look at their discussions, as you look at the debates, their point is the Egyptian army is ill-prepared, that therefore we must strike now. That it will take them at least a year and a half to two and a half years to be prepared for war, therefore we must strike now. There's no issue of existential threat. That was put together a little bit later on to justify the war. And on the June the 2nd, 1967, there was a meeting between the cabinet and the generals at army headquarters. Now, the interesting thing is that it's not only a question of two ideologies, there's a question of two generations. The Israeli army generals, the top brass, were in their early to mid-40s. Most of them were born in Palestine. Most of them served in the Haganah, the Palmach, the Jewish militia. They were indoctrinated and trained in order to take back the land of Israel and give it to the Jewish people. This is what they were trained to do. And they believed in it wholeheartedly. The Israeli cabinet was made of immigrants who came mostly from Eastern Europe. All but one, I think, came from Eastern Europe. They were all in their mid to late 60s. They had all gone through pogroms and um, all kinds of horrific, horrific experiences that Jude had got, Jews had gone through in Eastern Europe. And this was less than 30 years after the end of World War II. This was only 30 years after the Holocaust. And they were scared. They thought that war was a dangerous thing and they did not want war. And in the debate between the two sides, one of the points that was made by my, by my father was, you guys how dare you be hesitant? How dare you hesitate? This army that has won every single war, every single battle so far for the last 20 years, and how dare you hesitate and not let us attack? 
we have an opportunity here to destroy an army, not because there's an existential threat, but because we have an opportunity to destroy an Arab army. So I think this is really, really important to understand. There was no existential threat. Later on, almost all the generals admitted that the existential threat was a lie and a myth. It was a joke. It was a joke. But in Israel, people believed that the Arabs were going to come in and kill them just like the Nazis did 30 years earlier or 25 years earlier. And again, using fear uh, to put pressure is, 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 is a, is a well-known technique. As it turned out, the government uh, yielded. They, were, they couldn't stand the pressure, and they, and they, and they uh, agreed to let the army attack Egypt, a preemptive strike against Egypt, which, in which the Egyptian army was destroyed, the Egyptian air force was destroyed, and the Sinai Desert and the Gaza Strip were taken within a few days. Once this was done, the Israeli army knew that the Jordanian and the Syrian army, of course, were no match for them, and they took the Golan Heights and the West Bank, two areas that Israel had wanted for many years, because they had water resources and hills overlooking Israel, and of course the West Bank had you know, biblical Israel and the old city of Jerusalem, which they wanted for many, many years. Now, when we look at what happened in the 40 years since Israel conquered and finished, and you have to understand, Israel, by doing that, completed the conquest of the land of Israel. And this is the first time in 2,000 years that the Jews controlled the land of Israel again. So historically, from a Jewish perspective, this is huge. An Israeli army, a Jewish army, defeated our Arab armies and conquered the Holy Land again. But what happened in the last 40, 40, 45 years? What happened, say, in the West Bank since Israel controlled it? There's been a lot of investment. Billions upon billions of dollars, mostly American money, have been invested in the West Bank building cities and towns and highways and shopping malls and industry. And none of it, not a dime, went to Palestinians. All of the money, billions and billions of dollars, went in to bring Israeli Jews and Jews from other countries into the West Bank. Three million Palestinians who live in the West Bank were given nothing. They have no access to the cities and towns. They have no access to the new homes. They have no access to the highways. They have no access to the malls. They have no access to the highways. Somebody asked me once, how do they know if a car is a Palestinian car or an Israeli car? So when people say apartheid, everybody faints. This is apartheid. This is not apartheid. We'll talk about how the different laws apply to the due to populations. But this is what happened over the last 40 years, 45 years. Billions invested, but only to bring Israeli Jews, to bring Jews into the West Bank. Nothing at all for the Palestinians itself, themselves as their lands are being taken away to this very day. Their homes are being demolished to this very day. And they have nowhere to go, and a wall is being built around them. A wall that is, some of it is an actual wall, the other part of the wall are the Jewish settlements. Now, what is the most, the most important resource in the, in the region? Is water, of course. And it's interesting to see how the Israeli Water Authority distributes water. Now, all of the water in the entire land is distributed and controlled by the Israeli Water Authority, including, and there's a very large uh, water um, reservoir within the West Bank called the Mountain Aquifer. All of that water is controlled by the Israeli Water Authority, and the way they distribute the water is very interesting. Israelis, Israeli Jews, the people who live within Israel, are, are allocated 300 cubic meters of water per year. Palestinians in the West Bank are allocated somewhere between 45 and 80 cubic meters of water per year, less than a third, less than a third in, by a lot. Do Palestinians drink less, wash less? Do their plants need less water? But that's not it. That's only, that, this is not really the worst part. The worst part is that the Jewish settlers in the West Bank are allocated 1,500 cubic meters of water per year. Now, the World Health Organization recommends a minimum of 100 cubic meters of water per year per person. So again, when we talk about apartheid, then the question is, of course, where is the question? 
Now, I think, like I said in the beginning, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine is the issue. The ethnic cleansing of Palestine is the thing that drives all of these policies. Because if you have no water, you have no choice but to leave. If you can't work, you have no choice but to leave. If your kids can't go to school, then you have no choice but to leave. And Palestinians leaving is exactly what this ethnic cleansing is about. This is exactly what Israeli policies are all about. Now, what's interesting is people say, well, you know, what happened to the peace movement in Israel? Where, where, are the, where where's the, like, the peace now? And, you know, per Shimon Peres and Rabin and all these people. But if you look closely, if you look closely, you'll find that the ethnic cleansing of Palestine is a policy or a philosophy, I should say, that is shared by all the parties. All the Zionist parties have bought into this. It doesn't matter if they're right, left, or center, if they're Labour or Likud. On this particular issue, there is no difference. The process of ethnic cleansing is a process that has gone, has gone on and will go on as long as there's a Zionist government in place. And whether it's Labour or Likud, Netanyahu or anybody else, makes absolutely no difference. And again, if we look at the 64-year span since that United Nation resolution, you'll, you, can see, you can see the pattern. It's only a question of, dotting, of, of, of connecting the dots. Now, in order to execute this ethnic cleansing, Israel has created over the last 64 years several arms that conduct this. You've got the education system. You've got a bureaucracy that is completely dedicated to one thing, which is making life hell for the Palestinians. And you've got the military. And you've got the judicial system within Israel that allows all of these arms of the government to get away with murder, to get away with crimes that were they committed against Israeli Jews, they would be, pros they would be prosecuted. But because they are uh, perpetrated against Palestinians, they get a pass. And you see this over and over and over, cases that are brought to the Israeli Supreme Court over and over and again. The Israeli Supreme Court and the entire Israeli justice system has completely lent itself to allowing the ethnic cleansing process to go uninterrupted. And again, I'll, I'll talk about some more details in a minute. In order to justify the ethnic cleansing and in order to justify the need for a Jewish majority, because this is what Israelis always say, we have to have a state with a Jewish majority. How do you justify that? I mean, why would you have to have a Jewish majority? Why is the ethnic cleansing important? In order to justify this, you have to create an impression that the Arabs are dark, mean, cruel, incapable of edu being educated, and that they pose a threat. That they pose a threat to our actual being. That they're incapable of learning, they're incapable of getting along with Jews, they want to kill Jews, uh, that they're inferior, and of course they're incapable of creating their own government. They're inc incapable of governing themselves in any way, shape, or form. And the question that is often asked of me, and the question that I often ask is, how is it that Israeli children who are raised in a supposedly Western democracy with Western values end up going to the army and executing horrific, horrific crimes? treating people with such brutality that's sometimes hard to believe. And I like to reframe the question and ask, how would you educate? How would you educate children who supposedly grow up in a Western-style democracy to become brutal terrorists? How do you accomplish both? And of course, the, act, the, question, the answer is uh, an education system that is completely dedicated to this cause. And that's exactly what exists in Israel. It's an education system that is completely dedicated to teaching racism and to teaching apartheid and to developing them as a mindset. A new book just came out, or is about to come out any day, by my sister who's an educator and teaches at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And it talks about the, how Palestinians and Palestine are described in Israeli textbooks. And I'll give you a few examples, because this is really important. This is how ethnic cleansing works. This is how you develop apartheid. This is how you develop racism. I'll give you a couple of examples. She researched mostly history and geography books. Now, geography books are what? They seem, seem like a pretty benign thing, like a pretty neutral thing. And a couple of examples she brings are examples of maps, 
maps in Israeli geography books. So you have a map, one map, where now all the, all the maps, every single one of the maps, when they talk about Israel, it shows the entire country, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. So all of the land of Israel, not the state of Israel, whose boundaries are kind of unclear, but the land of Israel, which we all know is the larger land. So they have one that talks about uh, education levels and things like that in the community, in different communities. So you see Israel, and the West Bank is completely blank. Completely blank, and it says no data available. Now, when you look at a map and you see an area that's completely blank, what does that mean? It means it's barren. When you look at it, you think, oh, there's nobody there. It's completely barren. Another interesting map is a map, now, a map that shows um, uh, universities and colleges in Israel. Now, all these maps talk about Israel. There's no mention of another entity. And there are all these universities that, have, that exist in Israel and a few colleges, Jewish colleges that exist in the West Bank. Nothing, not a single institution exists that's a Palestinian institution. Most of the Palestinian cities are not even mentioned in the map. I mean, the major Israeli cities are all mentioned. Some of the settlements are mentioned as cities, but none of the major Palestinian uh, cities and towns are mentioned, and no universities are mentioned at all. There are 12 universities in the West Bank. And then another map that's interesting is a map that shows Jewish and non-Jewish towns and settlements in the West Bank, I mean in, in Israel. Jewish and non-Jewish. In other words, there's Jewish and there's somebody else, but they have no significant identity. Now, what do kids do? Kids study in school, they study for their tests, and then they, when they're 18, they matriculate and they go to serve in the army. Very few people actually pick up an extra history book and go, wait a minute, this isn't accurate. What we learn in school is what we know, and when we're 18, we move on. Well, in Israel, when you're 18, you're given a gun and you're sent to protect your country against those against that threat that is called the Palestinians that didn't exist in the maps. Now half the population, if you look at that map, half the population is Palestinian. You have about six million Israelis, about five and a half million Palestinians who live within that map. The claim in Israel is that Palestinians um, are about 20% of the population. But they only talk about Palestinians who live within the state of Israel. But the map they show is the entire map of the land of Israel or Palestine. Now what's interesting is, Israeli kids don't ever meet Palestinians. I mean, I grew up in Jerusalem, it's supposed to be a united city. I never met Palestinians. I mean, I saw them, I'd go visit the old city and I'd see Palestinians. I never met Palestinians. First time I met Palestinians was in this country. I was almost 40 years old. That's the first time I met Palestinians face to face and could sit and have a, like a normal discussion, like you know, people who are completely equal in every single way. That doesn't exist in Israel. Even sometimes the communities could be very close geographically. But Israeli children never meet Palestinians. So what they know is what they learn in school. And what they learn in school is that the Arabs are a problem that needs to be solved. The Arabs are a threat that needs to be eliminated one way or the other. Um, and then of course, when they are in, in the military, then their job is to eliminate that threat. And there are common methods of racist discourse that, are used, that were used by colonial powers over the years, and the Israeli textbooks are a textbook case of teaching racism, of teaching apartheid, a textbook case. The, describing people as something that they're not, which is not us. Um, describing people generally as a problem. Comparing Arafat to Hitler. Comparing the Palestinian resistance and national movement to Al-Qaeda invoking all these fears. Well, if they're like Al-Qaeda, if Arafat is like Hitler, and they're at our doorstep, well, of course we have to kill them. Do we care if they're children or not children? Because they're all a problem, they're all a threat. And when you're 18 and you have a gun and this is what you learned your whole life, then this is what you do. What they don't know, because they're never told, is for example that Palestinians have never had an army. Palestinians have never ever owned a tank. They don't have an artillery battery, not one. They don't have a, a war play, not one, never have. Or a warship, never have. Israel has one of the largest armies in the world and nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Who is the threat? 
But Israelis never see, Israeli children never see a picture of a Palestinian in any of their books. They never hear of a Palestinian writer or poet. They never see a picture of a Palestinian teacher or doctor. What they see is a caricature of Alibaba with a camel or massive refugee camps that display poverty and backwardsness. This is all they see. So this is all, this, all that they know. What else do they see? They see a wall being built. They see that there's a wall between us and them. Well, if there's a wall between us and them, that must mean that there is a very dangerous threat on the other side of the wall. Otherwise, why would the state, why would my state build a wall if there was no danger? It must be a terrible threat on the other side. And again, nobody even stops to think that there has never been a Palestinian military force. And again, Every single Israeli government, right, left, and center, has always been dedicated to solving the problem. And solving the problem is getting rid of the Palestinians. Solving the problem is the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. An interesting, an interesting thing also, you, you guys recall that a few months ago, Israel uh, and Hamas had this uh, prisoner deal, and Gilad Shalit, the soldier, was handed back. Gilad Shalit was a soldier, a combat soldier, part of a tank unit. Okay, on the border with Gaza. But everybody say he was a child that was kidnapped. Okay, soldiers are not children and they don't get kidnapped. On the other hand, and there's a complete hysteria about how unjust it was and how unfair it was and how inhumane it was that they captured this child, that they kidnapped the soldier. He was a soldier at a tank unit, armed, in service on the border of Gaza, probably inside Gaza. On the other hand, there's a complete ignorance and complete ignoring of the ongoing kidnapping of Palestinian children by the Israeli forces every single day, every single night, 2 a.m., Israeli forces barging into homes, smashing the door, taking children, 14, 12, 13, 16-year-olds, throwing them in jail, beating them up, no due process, no attorneys, no rights, and they're kept in prison for as long as the army decides that they want to keep them there. But somehow Israelis have, don't have a problem with that. They have a problem with a soldier that was being kidnapped. But again, this is part of the education system. Like I said, the other arm is the bureaucracy. And the bureaucracy is charged with making it seem like ethnic cleansing is actually just a bureaucratic, simple, unemotional if issue. And you see people losing their homes, being thrown out of their homes, homes being destroyed, lands being taken away, with people nowhere to go on a regular basis. And the process of ethnic cleansing, it's not just getting rid of the people, but it's also getting rid of the culture. It's a de-Arabizing process. I'll give you a couple of examples. When Jews immigrated to Israel from Arab countries, they looked like Arabs, they spoke Arabic, they liked Arabic food. They listened to Um Kultum. They were Arabs. Well, the Jewish uh, establishment uh, ha had to change that very quickly. So very quickly they learned that they had to change. And the discrimination against them was horrific over the years. We're talking about the early 50s. They had to change their clothes. They had to change their accent. They had to change their food. They had to change their music. The music they have to change. Everybody listens to this was the process, the process of de-Arabizing. You can't have Jews who are Arabs because Arabs are bad. So very quickly they have to learn that. And today, it's interesting, even if you look at Orthodox Jews who came from Arab countries, or whose ancestors came from Arab countries, they don't wear the traditional religious clothing of their grandfathers. They wear the traditional religious clothing of my grandfathers, who came from Europe. It was a success. They don't look like Arabs. This is how serious this is how serious they were about the ethnic cleansing and the de-Arabizing of the land. Now another stark, stark example of this, something that is taking place right now, and it's of immense proportion. Anybody here ever been to Jerusalem? Okay, good. So you've been to the old city? You know how the old city is walled, and it's, there's two different quarters. But when you're standing right outside the wall, when we're looking at the Jewish quarter, there's a wailing wall and Quarter. And as you look down, there's the Valley of Simon, a 
town called Siwan with 50,000 residents. Someone decided that under the homes of the people in Siwan, which is the Palestinian town, lies the true city of the King of David. Someone decided that that's where the city of David is, so they're building an archaeological park called the City of David. There's a, there's a foundation, an NGO, or a not-for-profit that is dedicated to rebuilding the city of David at the expense of the Palestinians. So 50,000 Palestinians have to leave their homes, their homes have to be destroyed to build an archaeological park to remind us of the existence of a king But Zionist archaeologists archaeologist decided that that was the place. So you've got hundreds of settlers already taking over the homes of Palestinians. You've got an entire private militia that protects them and makes life hell for the Palestinians. And you see digging being done under the foundations of the Palestinians' homes, making it dangerous to live there. Now as you look back, what is the process of taking place? It's a de-Arabizing of the whole place, of the whole region. Because what we want to create is we want to recreate the kingdom of David. We want to recreate this myth that there was this glorious city of Jerusalem during the days of King David. 50,000 people. I live in a town of 25,000 people. That's double that. Can you imagine if somebody came here to a town, here's some of 50,000 people, said, you know what? We destroyed the town completely because 3,000 years ago there may have been a king who had a city there. This is what is taking place. Today, today in Siwan. Obviously there are protests, obviously there are marches every so often. To protest this, the settlers and the militia shoot to kill with no mercy. A good friend of mine had a 17-year-old son shot there in May to participate in a protest. Shot, may have been a settler, may have been one of the militias. The police uh, closed the case saying that couldn't find any evidence, which is typical when Palestinian children are shot. Somehow, if they're shot by Israelis, there's never any evidence in the case of the So, it's ethnic cleansing, and it's de-Arabizing, and that's why mosques have to be destroyed, and churches have to be, have, been, have been destroyed, ancient cemeteries that demonstrate the fact that for the last 1,500 years this has been an Arab country, and a Muslim country, completely destroyed. The problem is the Palestinians are not going away. They're not going away. Like I said, today we have 6 million Israelis and about 5.5 million Palestinians. So we have to make sure that this bureaucracy, that by the way is in charge of what is happening in Siwan, is in charge of making sure the Palestinians can't return to their homes if they leave, that students who go overseas to study have a hard time coming back, that any of you who have been Palestinians and will be born here and have American citizenship can't come to visit unless you're held at the airport for hours upon hours upon hours. That Palestinians or Israeli citizens are harassed at the airport on the way in and on the way out. If I go in to Israel, I have an Israeli citizenship. If I have a citizenship, I go in, I can go out, whatever I want, it's all the time. Any Palestinian who's an Israeli citizen and goes in with me will be stopped. Either on the way in or on the way out. And checked and harassed. For hours and hours. And if you some of you may know this, but to be stopped for two, three hours is really no big deal. When it's over eight hours, or if you miss your plane, then you know it was a problem. But for most people to be stopped for two, three hours is completely, completely common. For one reason only. To make sure they don't come back. To make sure the experience is so painful and so humiliating that they don't come back. And there's an entire bureaucracy that's dealing with it. It's not even an emotional issue for them. It's a bureaucracy. There's a clerk that says, okay, Arab name, you go over there. And then a 19 or 21 year old kid who's security, certain security, to harass you for a few hours. No big deal, it's not personal. This is just security. But this is the mindset. And all this because the Zionists want to claim exclusive rights to that land. Exclusive 
rights. The only way you can claim exclusive rights is to get rid of those kids. Now let's talk about the military. I served in the Israeli army as well. Like I said, my father was a general in the Israeli army. And I'll tell you another interesting story. On the very first meeting of the Israeli general staff, of the top army commanders, after the Six Day War in 1967, in June 1967, right after the war. Of course, everybody fell you know, glorious. It was, it was, it was, it was a, an unbelievable accomplishment. They destroyed three Arab armies. The, the land that Israel controlled was enlarged by, you know, threefold. It was a huge victory. And at that very meeting, my father said this. He said, this is an opportunity to make peace with the Palestinians. We must be willing to get back the West Bank and Gaza right away to allow the Palestinians to, develop, to establish a state immediately. He said, if we don't do this, there will be resistance. The Israeli army will have to, will have to fight the resistance. Uh, the Israeli army will become a brutal occupied army. And eventually, we will become an apartheid state. He said this 45 years ago. Gun barrels were still smoking. And by the way, if we're talking about the Six Day War, it was a glorious victory. Close to 18,000 casualties were suffered on the Arab side. 700 casualties on the Israeli side. Things like that are not miracles, my friends. Things like that happen only when the intent is to kill and kill as many as possible. Now, the Israeli army, the purpose of the Israeli army is to make sure, again, to enforce the ethnic cleansing to make sure that the Palestinians who are thrown out and placed in concentration camps all around Israel never come back. Now mind you, this was just years after Jews were allowed out of concentration camps in Europe. The, is new, the new Israeli state placed Palestinians in concentration camps that still exist 40, some 64 years later to make sure that they don't return. If they do try to return, they're shot. And in the early 50s, the Israeli army created a special unit called Unit 101, which was led by probably Israel's most, most bloody general. His name was Ariel Sharon, you may have heard of him. And his claim to fame was that he would go into Gaza and kill as many people as possible. As many people as possible every time a Palestinian tried to cross the border and go back into, their, into Palestine. Now granted, some of those attempts did, con did engage, there was, there was violence. Perhaps they came in with a gun and shot someone. But by and large, these were people who were trying to go back to their homes, trying to back, bring food or something. And the order was to shoot to kill. And then again, to go in and retaliate. The Unit 101 was a retali retaliatory unit. And if you know anything about the Israeli army and you see them when they were young, you see how they grew up. They're all a bunch of crazy murderers, if you ask me. So this was in the early 50s, and the war against Gaza was established then. It was a war that is going on still to this day of every few years going in and killing as many people as possible, citizens, men, women, and children. And remember, there was never an army there. There was never a military force there. There was never a tank there. And Israel has always had a very strong, very big army. I won't go into all the details, but if you look at the history, you'll see that every few years, and many of these raids into Gaza were led by Ariel Sharon as he went up the ranks. Eventually, he was a general, and he led these. But every time they would go in, and of course the, 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 the purpose is to go in and destroy the terrorists. I think terrorist is a far better description, a, more, much more fit, a description that fits much more to the Israeli army itself than to any Palestinian resistance movement or any resistance that, that the Palestinians were ever able to, uh, to come up with. And I think probably the worst and you may agree with me on this, the most brutal, the most bloody attack on Gaza was what they like to call Operation Cast Lead. It began on the 27th of December, 2008, just what, three, three or just a few weeks before President Obama took office. And on the very first day, December 27th, 2008, at 11.25 in the morning, the Israeli Air Force began bombing Gaza, and within one day, they dropped 100 tons of bombs in one day. On the first day 
of a 21-day assault, 100 tons of bombs. Now let me give you some frame of reference. A one-ton bomb will destroy a city block. Gaza is one of the most heavily populated areas in the world. 800,000 children live in Gaza. They had nowhere to hide, they had nowhere to go because Gaza has been under siege. And one of the most ridiculous claims I've ever heard from the pro-Israel groups is, well, but they dropped leaflets and they warned them that, the, that, that this, uh, this was coming. And you know, you can imagine the, the, the mother or the father seeing the leaflet, leaflets, knowing very well what was coming, but also knowing well, very well there's nowhere to go. Nowhere to hide. When these planes start, when the bombs start falling, when the fires begin and the rubble begins and kids are, 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 are killed by, by, by the houses that are being destroyed and suffocated by the fumes and burnt by the phosphorus, and I'm not making this up, I'm not dramatizing it, this is, this is it. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to go because Israel locked Gaza. Nowhere to go. The Israeli Navy is holding it, you know, uh, uh, on the coast, and uh, the Israelis are holding the, 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 bound, the borders closed. And this was the first day of a 21-day assault. A hundred tons of bombs. Towards about halfway through, they decided to bring in ground forces. After a couple of weeks of so many hundreds of tons of bombs, you wonder why you would need any more forces. And if you look at pictures of the ground forces preparing to enter Gaza, you might think they're preparing to fight the Russian army. Rows and rows and rows of tanks, rows and rows and rows of, 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 uh, of combat units in their armored vehicles. Where are they going? Who are they fighting? What is their objective? There is no army on the other side. There is no tank on the other side. There is no artillery battery on the other side. There is no warship on the other side. What are they going to do with all these tanks? They're going to do one thing. They're going to kill people. And they're going to kill civilians. It's not an operation. It's a massacre. This is not an army. This is a terrorist organization. The Israeli army, my friends, is a terrorist organization that is dedicated to the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. And until, and until people in this country realize this and say this in the open and allow Israeli generals and Israeli officers to come to these colleges after they've retired and get scholarships and sit here with all, you know, heading all sorts of security institutions until this happens, and people stand up and say, you do not get a visa. Because I'll tell you what, I know hundreds of Palestinian activists who have never lifted a rock, who have never touched a gun, wouldn't dream of touching a gun, that don't get visas to come here because they're Palestinians. So that has to be reversed. So this is, this is the military arm of this. Now, this is besides the fact that, you may know this, every weekend in the West Bank, there's probably a dozen or so protests that take place in different places, in different regions, different cities, different towns, different villages. And you'll find anywhere between 25 and 100 people protesting or marching. And these are all peaceful marches. And it's all part of what's called the popular resistance movement, which is a nonviolent movement. Now, the, just, to, just to make sure everybody understands, the majority of Palestinian resistance over the entire span of the conflict has been nonviolent. If you look, for example, at the Palestinian prisoners in, at the, the prisoners in Israeli prison, the Palestinian political prisoners, right now there are about 7,000 of them. Over 90% have never lifted a rock, have never touched a gun. They're political prisoners. Now this is the second round of these thousands. There were 8,000 or so that were there before Oslo, before the early 90s, and they were released, and now there's a whole new batch, a whole new generation of prisoners. And these are all political prisoners. The vast majority never lifted a rock, never touched a, a gun or an explosive device. These are not terrorists any more than Martin Luther King was a terrorist. They are uh, freedom fighters. But they're freedom fighters who are dedicated to nonviolent struggle. So these protesters are met with brutal force by the Israeli army. Now, whenever I'm there, I, I participate in these protests, and 
And you'll see, like I said, 30, maybe 40 protesters walking with a, with a flag, Palestinian flag and a few banners. And suddenly, out of nowhere, you see 100 fully armed combat soldiers. And their officers are running around in jeeps and, you know, giving commands. And you go, what the? 25 peaceniks with a flag, for God's sake. You need a whole platoon of combat infantry soldiers and, and a brigade commander? And I say this to them. I say, are you out of your mind? Look at you guys. Helmets and everything and guns. And they're sweating because it's usually hot. And we're standing there with t-shirts, you know, free Palestine and a flag. And that's what you need this force for? And then they start the pushing and the shoving and the tear gas and the rubber bullets and the beating up and all this kind of stuff. This is what Israeli soldiers do. This is what the Israeli army is all about. It's about causing as much pain, it's about killing as many people, it's about making life impossible. It's about manning the checkpoints. This is what the Israeli army is about. And that is the other arm that is in charge of this, uh, of the ethnic cleansing. Now I'll tell you, I'll share two experiences that I've had with you with the Israeli army at these, po at these, at these protests. When people say Israel is an apartheid, what does that mean? Apartheid means that you've got different parts of the population being governed by different laws. So what do we have in Israel? You've got three different types of population. You've got the Israeli Jews who live in a society that is completely free, completely democratic, just like here, pretty much. And are protected by the law. You have the Palestinians who are citizens of the state of Israel who are third or fourth grade citizens. And there are over 20 laws in the Israeli law books that discriminate against them. And this is the law. This is regardless of the fact that discrimination is rampant in society. So if a Palestinian wants to rent an apartment in Tel Aviv, it's not illegal, but nobody, nobody will let them rent an apartment. Or I wouldn't say nobody, but the vast majority. And if they do, they'll get a letter from the other tenant saying, come on. And I know a lot of friends. They sign the lease and everything, and a couple of days later, the landlord comes and he goes, well, you know, I'd really, I don't mind that you're an Arab, but I've got 30 other tenants, and, you know, I'm sorry. So this is not the law. This is just the, 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 the reality in society, in Israeli society. But besides that, there are laws that discriminate them against them. And then you've got the Palestinians who live in the West Bank and Gaza Strip that have absolutely no protection under the law at all. They are governed by the brutal regime of the Israeli army and the other Israeli security forces. Some of them are a little bit more uh, covert than that. That's it. Three different populations governed by the same government, by the same Israeli government. Don't be fooled by the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian president, God bless him, he can't get in a car and drive anywhere without a permit from the Israelis. He can't get in a helicopter and fly, I don't know, go from Ramallah to Bethlehem without getting a permit from the Israelis. Israel governs every, the life of every single person in that land, but they govern them under different sets of laws. And again, I'll give you an example of something that happened to me. Okay, if I'm in the West Bank committing a, if I'm committing a crime and a Palestinian's committing a crime, we are dealt with under different laws. So I was at a protest in a small town called Bet Umar near uh, Hebron. And the army came, as I said, you know, this whole combat unit comes. And I open my big mouth and, you know, they arrest me right away and they try to shut me up and I won't. Anyway, we go back and forth, back and forth. And the army places me under arrest. And I stay there for a little bit longer while, you know, a little, more, a, little more, a little chaos goes on. And then finally, the army pass, takes me and gives me over to the Israeli civilian police. Now, the, the civilian police have to actually deal with me because I'm a civilian and I'm an Israeli. They usually treat me a little bit nicer and then they take me to the police station, which is in a town, a Jewish settlement. And at this particular time, they were waiting for the army commander that placed me under arrest to come in and file the charges. Well, he wouldn't show up. I mean, the guy's a brigade commander. He's almost a colonel. He's going to waste his time coming in, you know, dealing with me. And the soldiers that were charged with, you know, keeping me, protecting, you know, holding me so I won't escape or whatever, they're sitting there wondering why the police won't take me off their hands. And the police won't unless the officer comes and signs it. And it's this silly catch-22 thing going on. And the phones are going back and forth, and this is going on for hours. I spent an entire day there. Finally, the army said, you know what, we'll send them, a, they said to the police chief, we'll send you guys a fax. So the station chief came out, he was, he was, he was very, he was ticked off by then. He said to the soldiers, listen, he's an Israeli, he has rights. He's not a Palestinian that I can just throw in jail. 
Then they understood. Then they got it. He said it. I mean, the, if this is not apartheid, what is? If I was a Palestinian, an entirely different law would have governed how they deal with me. Would have dictated how they deal with me. Another example, I wasn't arrested, but I had a little conversation with the soldiers. We were driving to another place called Nabi Saleh. It's a beautiful spot in the West Bank, and there's protests there every week. The army is, is violent beyond anything you can imagine. Um, so anyway, as we got there, there's a roadblock, and they won't let us through, whatever. I was with a Palestinian friend, and we, I started talking with the officer. And the officer said, and I said, why, why are you even here? We're in the middle of the West Bank. Why are you even here? He goes, well, there's no difference between this place and Tel Aviv. This is just like Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. There is no difference. Now, there's a Jewish settlement not far being built on the lands of Nabi Saleh. And then the officer said to me, but why do you want to go there anyway? It's a war zone. I said, a war zone, really? I said, there's another army there? They have tanks? Do they have an artillery? Are they well armed? Are there lots of them? A war means two armies. I said, what you're doing is not a war. I said, what do you, you don't know what a war is. I said, what you're doing is called massacre. It's called ethnic cleansing, and you and all your soldiers are going to be tried for this one day. So then all the other soldiers came up, and they started being all tough and scary. And I had a Palestinian friend with me, and he came out, and he had his brother shot point black by an Israeli soldier at a checkpoint just like that one a few years back. So we, the two of us are discussing, because the discussion is heating up a little bit. And at one point, he told the soldiers, he said, well, you guys shot my brother. And they came back with, well, if we shot him, he deserved to die. And this is, if we kill them, that means it's okay. Due process is not necessary when you're killing a Palestinian. Anyway, we, I wanted us to get to Nabi Saleh and not be stuck with these guys. So I said, okay, fine. And I said, Dali, come on, let's get out of here. And before I left, I looked at the soldier and I said this. And I say this every single time I see soldiers in these situations ever since. I said, you don't know who this guy is. He's a very active peace. He's a very, very dedicated peace activist. He lost two brothers. <clears throat> He's a very dedicated peace activist. I said, you don't know who this man is, but believe me, one day you're all going to go on your knees and beg forgiveness from this man. And they, of course, were in shock. But I believe this is true. All of these soldiers, all these officers, some of them are going to be tried for crimes, that's for sure. But the ones that aren't are going to go down on their knees and beg forgiveness and say the famous line, I was only following orders. So this is the Israeli army. This is the Israeli terrorist organization, or the IDF, which I think is a terrorist organization. So like I said at the beginning, the important thing is to take a step back and connect the dots. And if you connect the dots, there's only one conclusion that I can see, and that is that the theme of Zionism is a complete ethnic cleansing of Palestine a complete de-Arabizing de of the land of Israel so that it becomes the land for the Jewish people, occupied by the Jewish people, with perhaps a small, quiet minority of Palestinians. This is the theme. What this means is that pa Palestinians have to live under the threat of terrorism, of Israeli terrorism, and Israelis live under the impression that there is a Palestinian terrorism that wants to wipe them out, and therefore they have to serve in the military, and therefore they have to spend billions upon billions of dollars to protect themselves. A good friend of mine by the name of Jamil Hilal, he's a professor at Birzeit University, he said this. <clears throat> he offered, he said this, he, he made the statement, and I think it offers Israelis a way to liberate themselves from the daunting and self-destructive task of policing another nation. And this is what his solution was, and I believe that this is the right solution. It's the establishment of a secular democratic state with no, with no distinction between citizens according to their religion, their ethnicity, or their national origin. A complete democracy, complete equal rights for everybody that lives in that land. Thank you all very much.